You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 82, by Rudolf Steiner, six lectures entitled Becoming Fully Human, The Significance of Anthroposophy in Contemporary Spiritual Life, translated by Jeff Martin. This is the last lecture, Lecture 6, entitled Anthroposophy and Agnosticism, given at The Hague on April 12, 1922. I have spoken to you in the preceding considerations about three successive but cooperative, supersensible modes of cognition, about imaginative cognition, inspired cognition, and intuitive cognition. And I have tried to explain to you those views about the world and life that can be achieved through the application of these modes of cognition. Today I want only to add to what was said yesterday. I want to speak now about the cognition that can be attained through such supersensible perception of our innermost being, about which humanity longs to be enlightened. This is because not only the satisfaction of some religious or theoretical need depends on it, but the very possibility of becoming fully human in the first place. All human striving ultimately aims at this. The human being wants to become fully human. That which forms the actual central being in us and which we initially face with our ordinary consciousness in such a way that we encapsulate it, as it were, in the single point that we then express with the word I, capital, we actually face in ordinary life at first as something unknown. And precisely the path of cognition I meant to characterize here leads little by little to the self-cognition that is first attainable for the human being. In order to make clear what I actually mean, I would like to use a comparison. When we look around us with our eyes, we see things due to the light, which is in itself supersensible, which in its effects in colors makes objects perceptible to us for this one sense. But we can say that we also see what is not actually illuminated by light. If we have somewhere a white surface, and in the center a black point, then we see, as we can imagine, the white due to the effect of light. But we also see the black point, that which confronts us as darkness. It is due to the darkness that we know something of this black point. This is more or less how it is in ordinary life with the perception of our eye, if we think about it correctly. We perceive the things around us, We also bring thoughts, feelings, and will impulses from our own soul life to consciousness. This is, so to speak, what is illuminated. But also in this realm, among all this, is what also belongs to us as our I, which we actually perceive only as a black spot. We know about it in our ordinary consciousness only through the fact that we do not perceive it. I would like to extend the comparison even further. I would like to remind you how you actually assemble in your memory all those moments, all those parts of your whole life on earth that you have witnessed because you have lived through them in the waking state. When you look back, you connect, as it were, in a single continuous current of recollection all those experiences you had while awake. But these experiences are everywhere joined by what you have passed through while you were asleep, let us say in dreamless sleep. Your dreams, however, also mostly belong to what is forgotten. In your recollections, you would also have to present these intermissions if you wanted to present the complete stream of your experiences to your soul. But we saw yesterday that the I with the astral body, that is the actual soul being with its center, the actual self, stays outside the physical body from falling asleep until waking up. They arise out of the unconsciousness in which they are during sleep only if 
they are not left to themselves but can submerge into the temporal etheric body and the spatial physical body. With the help of these supports, we cannot really call them tools in the proper sense, as we saw yesterday, in which our thoughts, our mental images are illuminated, and through these images then, although more dreamlike and also asleep, our feeling experiences and our will impulses. In order for the I and the astral body to really unfold the forces they have within them, their immersion in the etheric body and in the physical body is necessary. Thus, in ordinary consciousness, when you recollect your life on earth, you never remember the true form of the I and the astral body, but only what arises when this I and this astral body are supported by the physical and etheric bodies. From this you will see that it is more than a mere comparison when I speak of the I and the astral body, that is the actual soul being, as being like a dark point within what is actually perceived. In retrospect, we would have to see this I and this astral body in their true form and capacities, We would have to see them not merely as dark inclusions, but as realities, as we otherwise perceive realities. But we lift these soul entities out of their indeterminacy, their imperceptibility, through imaginative, inspired, and intuitive cognition. First of all, as I explained yesterday, we lift the thinking part of our soul being out of dark uncertainty, by submerging this thinking part into the physical body. Actually, this thinking part at first takes up from the physical body, for its actual thinking force, only what is present in this physical body as air-like substance. And then, when fully awakened, sensory perceptions, emotional experiences, and will impulses or desires are added to this thinking. When it is, as it must be, fully immersed in the physical body, then everything that is in the physical body, which otherwise merely passes by in dreams, can be taken up by the soul. And what would otherwise be merely dreamlike, fleeting thoughts, as long as these processes take place only in the air-like substance of the body, can now condense, so to speak, into the faculties of memory, and into that which as thoughts and mental images, joins with sense perceptions or feeling experiences or will impulses. With the means of cognition of which I have spoken, we can study the human organism in a much more detailed way than we can without these means of cognition. Just ask yourselves what kind of mental image people usually have of their physical bodies, if they only think a little. Of course, if they think more than a little, other things immediately become clear. We usually have the mental image that the skin limits the physical body. We have the image that inside this skin there is actually an enclosed mass, which is thought to be more or less solid or semi-solid. But we must take into account that hardly 10% of the human body is really solid. We are, for the most part, a column of liquid, and we constantly carry air in us, too. Through the air we are constantly undifferentiated from the outside world, are joined together with the outside world. The air that was just outside is then inside me. The air that I have breathed in, which has been processed in the body, is then outside. Thus human beings, if they are to be understood completely, according to their physical bodies, must be regarded as solid, liquid, and gaseous bodies. And all this is permeated by the element of warmth, which works in these different states of substance. When, upon awakening, the soul is drawn into the body, the purely thought-like element does not submerge itself further than the air element in our body. The thoughts take hold of the air, the gaseous. It is quite wrong when speaking of thinking, to only speak of oscillating nerve processes and the like. All this is revealed to imaginative cognition. Mere thoughts, which also live in dreams, first seize the air, 
Then, as this gaseous element is taken up into certain processes, the thoughts are transferred to the watery element, and from there they imprint themselves on the solid, salt-like element. Through this, it is possible that later reflex memories arise, namely through processes whose description I must unfortunately omit for lack of time, although they are very interesting. Here we see in an intimate way into the working and weaving of the soul and the body. It is graded according to the aggregate states of the human physical body. This physical body gradually becomes transparent. We see the weaving and working of the soul in it. We see, as I said, that which remains actually dark for ordinary consciousness. Yesterday I expressed this by saying that when we have the simplest impulse of will, we first have the mental image that something should be executed. For example, the arm should be lifted. Then this mental image of the goal shoots into our organism to become will. This escapes ordinary consciousness just like in sleep. With regard to the will, ordinary consciousness sleeps even in the human waking state. But then we see the effect and this again as a mental image. Then, however, if we study the matter with the means of cognition characterized here, we see when the thought becomes animated into an impulse of will in us, that this thought also first has an effect in the air element of the human physical body. It then transfers itself again to the liquid and the solid elements. Then, through the impulse of will, matter is burned up, so to speak. In the liquid part of the human physical organism, matter is returned to nothingness in the sense I described yesterday. But because this takes place, because matter is led back into nothingness, empty spaces, so to speak, are created in our physical body. These empty spaces cause a completely different dynamic. We live into them. Now, with our means of cognition, we see through something that becomes an act of will. We first perceive the thought, and then perceive how the thought shoots into the body, where we witness the depositing of matter, and how the body then destroys this matter. The other side of a state of equilibrium thereby arises, when, after having been created, matter is led back into nothingness. This experience of another equilibrium leads to the fact that now the physical body's movements follow this calling forth of another equilibrium, that it then comes into action, to that action which has immediately taken hold of the human physical body. In this way, a human act of will actually becomes spiritually transparent, transparent down to the details. Just to show you that anthroposophy is truly not something that just blathers and talks drivel, about the indefinite, but that it is something that enters into the very concrete facts of the world, I would like to give you a small example where an impulse of will also exists. This example is taken from language. We have the word here, here. I want to choose a characteristic word. I could also choose another word. I say, die Schachtel liegt hier. The box is here. What is actually going on in the human organism when it comes to pronouncing the word here? The first thing to happen is that what lives in the breath is seized in the subconscious. And what lives in the breath is now the thought. The thought lives in the breath. Only then do we have a real mental image of thoughts, when we know from anthroposophic cognition that thought can really live in the breath that it is a force that can act on the breath. We come to all the difficulties of psychology in respect to the physical only when we cannot go into these details. If, of course, we believe that a thought could directly lift a bone, that is, that in such a robust way it could act on physical matter, then we cannot arrive at the truth. But if we know that the thought is something which is transferred by a detour, through the warmth element to the air element, and then what is aroused there is continued into the rest of the organism, then we come to grasp 
what is there as an impulse of will. Thus we can say, we have first the experience of breathing. This experience remains unconscious. Only the cognition characterized here can lift it up into view. Then comes the second. We experience inwardly what now continues from the breathing process into the fluid element of the organism. We experience in the organism of speech that which indicates a direction. In the case of the arm, it would mean a stretching out of the arm. We perceive this in the syllable he. There we perceive the continuation of this air thought into the aqueous element of the stretching movement, so to speak. We see through imagination the transition from the breath-air movement into the fluid stretching movement. And then this stretching movement is actually formed in the R. If I were to say only he, I would have to draw it thus. A horizontal line is drawn. Number one, breathing process equals H. Two, stretching movement equals E. But if I should now draw the stretching movement as it is experienced unconsciously when I pronounce here, I must draw it like this. An undulating line is added. I perceive the breathing process perceive the direction of the stretching, which is not carried out, but which then rolls along in the R. And then I have really experienced inwardly cognizing what is present as an impulse of will when I pronounce the word here. In this way we can follow the impulses of will, which take shape in language. If we look with imagination into the whole weaving and working of what runs as soul through the physical body and the etheric body, or the body of formative forces. With imagination, then, we can first survey such things as I have described here. When inspiration is added, we see how the soul plays in. We see how, so to speak, the physical and etheric bodies are something that exists externally in space and time, and how the soul plays on this. Well, I cannot exactly say as on an instrument, because this is continually being created again by the soul's processes, as on a support, a foundation, that is continually worked on. Through inspiration, then, we advance to the actual realization of the work of the soul in a physical organism. When we then ascend to intuition, we perceive something else. Then we realize that there is a lawfulness in the world, which has nothing to do with physical lawfulness, but a lawfulness which takes hold of the human being. I can perhaps best express myself about this fact in the following way. If you look back in later life to the way your life on earth has unfolded, then you will find, if you are honest with yourself, that you are actually nothing other than that which you have become here in physical earthly existence through these life experiences. Just consider something out of this life. Consider how you have learned to think, how you have learned to feel, how you have perhaps been stimulated to do this or that by the fact that you have met a certain person at a certain time of life, someone who has perhaps had an effect on your character. Put all these individual experiences you have gone through together and ask yourself whether you would not have become something different in relation to what you are now for the outer world if other experiences had entered your existence. If you go through this train of thought properly, you will very soon see how, from the very beginning, something has lived in you that has unconsciously drawn you to those events which have become so important in your life. It is interesting how sometimes people who have reached a certain age and have not dreamt their life away come to grasp the true facts of life, When they look back on their life, they experience it in a deeper sense, and they come to say to themselves, Goethe's friend Knebel, for example, was such a person, they say, when I look back on my life, everything is as if ordered according to a plan. If the smallest event were actually missing from it, I would not be in my earth existence, just exactly what I am today. If the smallest event had been missing, then I would be changed perhaps only a small change, but a change nevertheless. Just think what, say, the sixty-year-old Goethe 
would have been if he had not gone through his Italian experiences. In Goethe's case, you can almost touch it with your hands. He did not move to Italy on a whim, but because there was a deep longing in him. But these deep longings are not only such that we can always explain them by analyzing them exactly to see how one thing followed from another. Rather, they are born with us. We really find something planned in our life. Of course, you could be mistaken about this at first. I have mentioned this only because you can approach what is given through intuitive cognition through the most ordinary contemplation. Intuitive cognition really provides a full insight not only into what works as soul in our organism, but into what works as the center, the I, capital, the actual being of the self in us. And the self-being shows itself before intuitive vision at the third level of supersensible cognition. It shows that we are not really passively confronted with the facts of the outer world, but are drawn to them by our predisposition which arises not through heredity, but out of our deepest central soul being, which was drawn into us from a soul spiritual world at birth and has taken on a physical earthly body. Through intuitive cognition, you come to the conclusion that this I does not really enter earthly life so as to be completely passively devoted to the facts that happen to approach it, but rather that it is strongly attracted by one fact and strongly repelled by the other. This I directly seeks its path in the world. In short, it is born because it carries the predisposition to its destiny within itself. And if you then further develop this intuitive insight into your own human self-being, then you come to see that this I has gone through repeated earth lives. But these repeated earth lives once had a beginning at a certain point in time, in an ancient form of existence before which the I was still so little separated from its environment that such an alternation between earth life and spiritual soul life did not exist. These repeated earth lives will continue to be experienced until a point in time when the I will then again be so similar to the spiritual world in its entire inner formation, that it will no longer need separate earth lives. Thus, when we fully cognize the I, we look at repeated earth lives. We look, in other words, at the total life of the human being as proceeding in such a way that we have a portion of this life between birth and death, or conception and death, and another portion between death and a new birth. Thus we human beings live out our full existence in repeated lives on earth. The objection is usually made that a person does not remember these repeated earth lives. This concerns only ordinary consciousness. At the moment when intuition enters, that which passes through repeated earth lives becomes just as visible to the inner soul as otherwise the memory is within one earth life. Thus, it is also here that anthroposophy does not arrive at its results through abstract proofs, as does ordinary philosophy, but by first preparing the soul for higher cognition and then cognizing these things through contemplative vision. In this way, however, this anthroposophic cognition proves to be a continuation of the cognition that we use today in natural science. However, it is a continuation that has to work in a completely different way than the mere natural scientific cognition recognized today. It is often asked, where does anthroposophy prove what it claims? Those who ask in this way, and who therefore deny anthroposophy's scientific character, because the usual kind of proof is not available in anthroposophy, do not consider the following. I can only explain these things approximately, but they apply in the most exact, most precise sense. Those who seek to prove something show through the very fact that they seek to prove it that for them what must be proved is not readily perceptible. 
we actually seek to prove something whenever we have no direct perception of it. If I am to prove that yesterday a man was here in this room, then I will need a proof only if I have not seen the man here myself. So it is, in essence, with all proofs. So it is also with regard to the historical development of humanity. When in older, instinctive cognition, people had a perception of what they called the divine being, they did not need proofs. Historically, the proofs for the existence of God began only when the perception was lost. Evidence is required wherever there is no perception. The anthroposophic method, however, consists in first preparing the human soul in such a way that it can arrive at direct perceptions. When the results are then described, that is, the peculiarity of anthroposophy, then it can be brought into forms of common sense and understood in the same way as non-artists can understand a work of art, although they cannot produce it. Therefore, we cannot make the objection that anthroposophy cannot be comprehended with common sense. Only those who are themselves anthroposophical researchers can investigate it, but it can be understood by anyone who wants to use their common sense without prejudice. Thus we see that it is, first of all, a matter of cognition of the human being, self-cognition, cognition of what the I really is, while otherwise, with our ordinary consciousness of the I, we have only an emptiness, a darkness, a void. Thus to such cognition as I have described, the real I is given. But then this I can be seen precisely in its eternity, and in this eternity as a continuation through repeated earth lives. Just as I have shown you how will, how volition in the human organism becomes transparent to the soul, I had already hinted at this on the preceding days, the outer world is also made transparent. The soul spirituality of the outer world is cognized through imagination, inspiration, and intuition. Many people who today become superficially acquainted with what anthroposophy communicates, perhaps even only from the writings of its opponents, very often say that anthroposophy is only a rehashing of old world views. For example, they say it is a rehashing of Gnosis, which still prevailed in the first Christian centuries among very many people. Therefore, they say, we are dealing with something that has basically been disproved by the development of humanity over time, or at least has been overcome. Someone who has really listened to what has been offered in these lectures will not be tempted, if they also know this gnosis, to somehow throw anthroposophy, which appears with new means and methods of cognition and reckons with humanity's present level of consciousness, together with gnosis. Anthroposophy works in such a way that it presupposes the scientific development of the last few centuries. Gnosis, of course, did not count on this, because its existence preceded the development of natural science. But there is something else that could lead to the temptation to throw anthroposophy together with Gnosis. Only, you will not do this if you really go into the essence of anthroposophy. The thing that perhaps causes anthroposophy to be lumped together with Gnosticism is in a certain way that anthroposophy must also reckon with what in our time is a leading worldview, and that is agnosticism. This agnosticism is in a certain respect the counter-image of Gnosticism and is also the counter-image of anthroposophy. However, in another respect, agnosticism can be characterized, first of all, in relation to its theoretical aspect. As an example, take the way Herbert Spencer speaks. Many others have followed him, but they do not fully realize that they are agnostics. But in fact, they are agnostics according to their whole way of thinking. In effect, he said, we see the sense world around us. We have this intellect which rises from observation and experiment to a view of the laws of this world. To this one adds what can be seen by ordinary consciousness as soul phenomena. In this too one searches for some kind of laws, but this is only done in a meager way. 
Then, however, those who do not simply reject everything supersensible by contenting themselves with an intellectual understanding of sensory perception and inner soul experiences, as these appear to ordinary consciousness, say, yes, but one cannot penetrate with human faculties to any kind of primal source or sources that lie behind the phenomena. One cannot attain to a real gnosis, a real Gnosticism. One cannot attain to knowledge. You are considered an enlightened person today just by admitting that the primal sources of things cannot be known, cannot be investigated. Agnosticism has taken hold of wide circles precisely in this form. This is also present in different variations. This agnosticism, however, when it appears philosophically, is a kind of opposition to anthroposophy. I could, if I felt like it, start from this point onward to criticize polemically, depending on my temperament, to rail against contemporary agnosticism. What is to be said about it, insofar as it really brings ruin to the human forces of progress for civilization, you will soon be able to read in the magazine titled Die Drei. I have also explained this in a lecture I gave at a university course in Stuttgart. As I said, I could also approach the matter from this side, but I do not want to do that today. I would like to point out something about this agnosticism that had to arise in the spiritual development of humanity. Certainly errors can arise in the individual areas of existence. Then we become critics of these errors. We have to eradicate these errors and illusions. But if something appears with such a widespread as agnosticism, then we can certainly fight it, and the fight can have its truth. But we must still ask, yes, but how is it that within the spiritual development of humanity something like this agnosticism has arisen? Now, people who see deeper into these things must say the following to themselves. In the development of humanity, we had to advance to a point of a pure phenomenalism, as Goethe also demanded it. To that pure phenomenalism, which no longer uses thinking to construct all kinds of atomistic worlds that can no longer be perceived behind sense perceptions, a phenomenalism which uses thinking merely to read the sense perceptions, to stop within the phenomenal world, to order the phenomena in such a way that they appear to us as primordial phenomena, in Goethe's sense. All this has been explained here in the most different variations during these days, and this is something I strictly defended in a lecture the other evening in relation to external natural science, and especially the inorganic natural sciences. I do not want to say that there is not something like this need for pure phenomenalism living in a great number of people of the present time. Nevertheless, there is the aspect where a certain theorizing is prevalent, where, because we are only in thinking, as it were, we pierce the veil of the senses and continue rolling with thinking for a while behind sense perceptions, where there is actually nothing more for thinking to do. There we then erect atoms and all kinds of other things. This corresponds to a kind of law of inertia. However, the use of thinking, according to our present position, our present relation to the world, is actually applicable in such a way that it can only serve us for grouping the mutual interpretations of the phenomena. It serves us to remain within the phenomenal world, reading off the phenomena, as it were, and not substituting all kinds of explanatory things for them. When someone writes down the word table, they thus have single details. They try to put the single letters together into a word. They read it. They would begin a false activity if instead of reading the word they were to say, behind T I have to assume all kinds of forces and processes that construct the T for me. Then comes the A. This is how those appear who, following an inner law of inertia, attempt to pierce the sensory veil with their thinking instead of reading in the sense world. They penetrate the world of the senses 
and propose hypotheses, which is not to say anything against phenomenal atomism. There are many people, though, who currently have an awareness that we must arrive at a pure phenomenalism. This is simply the tendency of natural science. The natural scientists themselves practice more experimentation and observation and reflect less on their methods. Therefore, we cannot particularly blame them if all kinds of constructions are added to the phenomena. Then they believe to have real facts in these constructions. But certain philosophical minds feel it must come to pure phenomenalism, in particular among Western thinkers. In the East it is quite different. We often have such personalities. They realize exactly that the science of the external world must finally come to the point of grasping the phenomena purely, and to use thinking only to let the phenomena interpret themselves mutually. Quote, everything factual is already theory, close quote, says Goethe. And in William James, the American who established pragmatism, a philosophical interpreter has arisen who promotes pragmatism. In Europe, it has emerged more blatantly in the so-called Quote, as if philosophy, close quote, where they say that you should not interpret anything into the phenomenon. Rather, you must ascend to something that is no longer phenomenon. Thus, one does not say about what arises there. Quote, it is there, close quote. But rather, one acts as if it were there. Much clearer than this as-if philosophy is the philosophy of William James, who actually gives up any substantial working of the force of thinking. He is clear about it. With thinking, we can only group external facts and come to something by which we can then control these external facts practically in the service of the development of humanity, of civilization. Thus he actually sees in all natural laws to which humanity advances nothing but practical guidelines, so to speak, with which to manage the world. Basically, this is something toward which phenomenalism tends. If you study it in its purity in Goethe, where it appears in quite a wonderful way with full justification, then you recognize that it just had to arise, it had to be there. For only by coming to pure phenomenalism can we fully, through this, become enlightened about what is actually in our environment. But then, everything that goes beyond the phenomena is at first something that the human being cannot cope with. If you do not know anything about the methods of cognition that ascend into supersensible worlds, ascending from the phenomena as facts to other facts that are, however, supersensible, then you must, by tending toward phenomenalism, finally say to yourself, there are only phenomena. That is all that is given. If I arrange them with thinking, I experience nothing that lives further behind them than the phenomena themselves. For the primal phenomena are in the end also only phenomena, so that I actually get nothing from them but practical principles for using the phenomena in service to humanity. Assume this were already completely developed. This phenomenalism would be there and thinking would only consist of regulative principles which technically, statistically, arrange the phenomena. But then we have something that we can no longer call cognition in the sense of the older concepts of cognition. For example, those of gnosis. For in what did that consist which in former times out of humanity's instinctive world do, was always called cognition. In my book titled The Riddles of Philosophy, CW18, you can read details of Greek times. At that time, cognition consisted in the fact that, in general, when they looked at the world, they did not only have sense perceptions of tones, colors, qualities of warmth, but they perceived thoughts objectively, outside themselves, just like colors. Goethe still claims to see his ideas in the world as the Greeks saw ideas in the world, namely like sense perceptions. But now imagine such a person in this soul-sensory activity. They look at something, 
not only at the colors but also at the thoughts. By looking at the thoughts, they feel in themselves, they experience in themselves, not something passive, as today, where we have the mere sensory phenomenon before us, but they felt activity within themselves. This is the reason why Plato says that there is something active in seeing, something like grasping. He felt something like activity, something that connected him as a human being with what he saw as an object outside. And this was cognition. This feeling, this experience of activity was not merely the acceptance of something passive. Today this way of experiencing cognition has only remained with some people who live more in their instinct than in their intellect. Or it has been newly acquired, not instinctively, as was still the case with Gnosis, but now fully consciously by those who are working their way up to higher levels of cognition through the anthroposophic approach. Today, however, ordinary consciousness is approaching more and more the point where it is passively given over to external phenomena. It is coming to the point where thinking is no longer counted among the phenomena, where it lives only within people as a guiding principle in order to arrange the phenomena ever more technically in the service of modern culture. Thus, what we accomplish now within the outer phenomenal world does not lead to cognition in the ancient sense. There are those who still have religious content from old traditions involving the divine impulse, like Spencer, for example. When they look at what today is called cognition, but which is no longer cognition or gnosis, they say that one actually does not come to a fundamental or origin in this phenomenal existence. This is agnosticism. And basically, this agnosticism already has two sides. On the one hand, it deprives us, as whole human beings, of everything that fills us with strength when we have activity in cognition. On the other hand, we have to go through this phase of human development of being purely, passively devoted to phenomena. It belongs to the total development of the human race to form this phenomenalism in the Gertian sense, because it presents to us a level of truth that is necessary for our total human development. What follows from the fact that we come to the phenomena? What happens if we are drawn into agnosticism because we know nothing but the external phenomena? It follows, if we want to remain human beings, that we must find the spiritual world in some way other than by interpreting the external sense world. And for that part of the external world, that underlies the sense world, it must be said, we do not find it within the sense world. There was a time in my life when I was acquainted with a number of so-called teleologists, people who said that the mechanistic worldview, this pure phenomenalism for the external world, was not enough. One of these people, Nikolaus Kosman, even wrote a book, which was admired by many, about titled Empirical Teleology. He tries to prove that we cannot get along with mere causality, but that we can, purely empirically, also determine a certain purpose in natural phenomena. He felt very elevated above the mere mechanistic, which has its certain justification in external natural science, by introducing in this way again a kind of teleology. At that time I said something like this to people, also to Nicholas Kosman. Imagine a clock before you. This clock can be explained completely mechanistically. Nothing is there that causes us to assume little demons inside that make the wheels turn or something like that. Every kind of nebulous mysticism is excluded if we look only at the thing. I strictly represented the view that the world of appearance must be explained from out of itself. Adding any kind of interpretation, teleology or the like, into the thing is bad. However, a watchmaker made the watch. I will not get to know the watchmaker from the watch, but I can get to know him as a human being. I have to choose other methods than an analysis of the watch to get acquainted with the watchmaker. I seek him out, perhaps in a social context, somewhere other than his workshop. At the moment when we are clear about the fact that the outer world is to be grasped 
phenomenologically. At that moment, we have not despiritualized it. But we have shown the necessity of searching for this spirit, this supersensible, in other ways, through other means and methods of cognition. And these are the ones I have described. They must be added to the phenomenological methods of cognition. As you can see, anthroposophy strives to fully substantiate phenomenalism, to fully accept it. For it is clear that what leads to spiritual worlds must be reached with these other methods of cognition. Thus, what underlies the outer world of the senses is also spiritual. So, you see, on the one hand, I could have also brought forward what I brought forward in Stuttgart, as I said before. I could have said that mental images become weak within agnosticism because they are only passively devoted to the outer world. But, because we have weak images, we also have weak feelings. Then these feelings live in human beings in such a way that they have to be whipped up, stirred up. Then feelings become sentimental, or they remain obtuse, so that they become untruthful. Such feelings become nebulous, sentimental, or dull. Thus a trait of naturalism or untruthfulness has entered our art, for art in particular starts from the world of feelings. As a result, however, because our mental images do not enter as strong forces into our impulses of will, we lack proper determination today. In particular, we lack the resolve to accept something new. We let what seems unfamiliar to us pass us by as sensational. This is also basically how it has been with anthroposophy now for twenty years. Many people have heard it or heard of it, but they cannot decide out of habitual experiences of the soul to let it be more than sensational. Agnosticism makes us weak right into the will. It even makes us weak toward religious experience today. Thus it happens that many people who have striven for a long time to have an elementary religious experience are again immersed in the traditional religious creeds. How many honestly striving people have recently returned to Catholicism or they return to Oriental mysticism? Because agnosticism makes our mental images weak, we do not have strong enough feelings to have elementary religious experiences. Anthroposophy adds an upsurge, a thrust, through imagination, inspiration, and intuition to the passive processing of the world as phenomenalism. It thereby even leads to a real grasp of what lives as a supersensible element in our historical existence. It comes to a real comprehension of the mystery of Golgotha. It grasps the mystery of Golgotha in such a way that we can see how the pure divine being, the Christ being, took possession of the body of Jesus of Nazareth. Through this the mental images of the resurrection, of the connection of the living Christ with our human development on earth, gain a real meaning. For it is a deeply significant fact that theologians who are held to be enlightened today have said, yes, we have to look at the life of Jesus. The resurrection is indeed a matter of faith, but we can speak of this as arising only out of faith. But we cannot really speak about what actually happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. However, anthroposophy, in its turn, can speak of these things because they can only be grasped supersensibly. They cannot be grasped with the usual historical methods taken from the sense world. Thus I could speak at length about the dulling of our religious life by agnosticism, which is widespread today. But I only want to hint at this. It has already been described elsewhere. But everything has two sides. We can also speak of agnosticism in such a way that it has appeared as a necessary phase of development in the recent history of humanity. It is, as it were, the counter-effect of pure phenomenalism, to which we must work our way. But even if this pure phenomenalism is of great interest to us as we work our way into it, we cannot gain from it what is important to us, above all, for our innermost humanity. We have to gain that in another way. Now let me once again, not out of vanity, 
but because it is relevant to the matter at hand, insert something personal. I have already mentioned that in 1894 I completed my book titled The Philosophy of Freedom. I am convinced that such a book could not have been written by anyone who is not a pure phenomenalist with respect to natural science. For what was I compelled to do in order to establish moral truth, despite the fact that I am a pure phenomenalist in the field of natural science? I was compelled to introduce moral intuition in the philosophy of freedom. I have already characterized moral intuition here as something thoroughly supersensible spiritual. I was especially resented for my ethical individualism at that time. But this was necessary. I had to show that in the individual human being, in an individualistic way, moral impulses can be experienced intuitively already by ordinary consciousness. Otherwise, intuition can be attained only through higher exercises. It was necessary to work in this way in order to give a foundation to the moral realm for pure phenomenalists, who already at that time rose into the spiritual world. For in the face of pure phenomenalism, moral impulses cease to exist, if you are only completely honest with yourself. If you are dishonest, you can come to all kinds of illusions. But whoever has met people who have wrestled with world views, not in theories but in every fiber of their spiritual life, knows what the inclination to phenomenalism, which has agnosticism in its wake, can mean for people today. I have already met people who have said to themselves, if we grasp the world with today's scientific means, we see only natural processes in it. We can follow this hypothetically up to a primeval nebula or other such events that were supposed to have happened to our earth. We can follow this all the way to the end, to its heat death or something similar. But there we see that if we want to form within us a moral realm, it is nevertheless only vapor and fog that arises over the only true reality, a reality that begins with the primeval fog and ends with heat death. And after this heat death, there will be the great corpse field, not only for all that has lived on earth, but also what has striven here for moral impulses, for religious inwardness. All this will be buried. Certainly not many people feel this discrepancy yet for their own spiritual life, but there are people who feel it. I have met them with all the inner tragedy that made them doubt not only the reality of religious experience, but also the reality of a moral world order. They see only vapor and fog arising from merely external, phenomenalistically comprehensible facts. This is essentially due to our present world's social structure. Millions and millions of people, especially in proletarian circles, see reality only in external, economic phenomena. That which is spiritual, law, morality, art, is nothing, as they say, but an ideological superstructure something that merely arises like an illusion, an ideology. And so we have advanced in the agnostic direction to the point where we speak only of ideology. I was once very active in proletarian circles. I have experienced the sense in which ideology is spoken of there. This is basically only the fault of those who today speak of everything spiritual from the direction of science, not quite clearly, not quite honestly, but actually in the sense of an ideology. We have arrived at the opposite pole in the development of humanity, in comparison to the Oriental worldview as it once was. They spoke of Maya and of true being. Everything that is accessible and attainable only for the senses was to them an illusion, Maya. The real, the truly real, was what was comprehensible to the human being only above the sensory. Today we stand within a worldview that represents exactly the opposite. For those who are agnostics, the sense world is the only real thing. They might as well use the word maya instead of ideology, for that which can be grasped beyond the sense world. That is the way this world should be translated. Our modern maya is the spiritual. At one time, maya was the sum of sense phenomena. 
but with this we are forced, precisely because we had to arrive at this point, to take other paths of cognition. For if we now ascend through imagination, inspiration, and intuition into spiritual worlds, then we cognize precisely that which first leads us to the actual human being. And we find a strong impulse to ascend into these worlds when we become fully aware that the sense world may be explained only from out of itself, with its own methods. This gives us the impulse. But then, if the sense world can be explained only with its own methods, then thinking serves it only as a tool of explanation. Then, thinking has a meaning for the sense world only as a servant, for the mutual interpretation of the phenomena. Thinking really brings the phenomena together in such a way that they explain one another. Then thinking, as we have it in pure phenomenalism or agnosticism, is only images. But then it no longer contains reality. The Gnostic felt the reality of thinking by perceiving it. Our thinking has a mere image existence. What follows from this, if we really ascend to this pure thinking and grasp our moral impulses in it? Well, if I have a mirror here, reflecting images in it, then the mirror images cannot force me to do anything by causality. I cannot be induced to do something by mirror images. Our thinking has progressed so far in the world development of humanity that it really has only an image character, but then it no longer contains causality for us. Then pure thinking, if we have moral impulses, is formed into impulses of human freedom. Through the fact that we have come to phenomenalism, and thus to pure pictorial thinking, and through the fact that we can grasp moral impulses from the power of pure pictorial thinking, we also go through the stage of freedom. We educate freedom into our being by going through this phase of human development. This is what I wanted to show in my book, The Philosophy of Freedom. But we become free only when we have a thinking that is a picture thinking, that operates entirely within the physical body, as I have described it. The moment we look further back, we do not look at freedom, but at destiny. You see, there we find the possibility of cognizing what we call human destiny, because it rules in the unconscious, because we only arrive at its ruling when we ascend to intuition. Precisely because we find spiritual laws in this destiny, laws that work through repeated earth lives, we have spiritual necessity in it. But by descending into earth life, we lift ourselves out of necessity for certain actions, direct ourselves only according to image-infused thinking, and are thereby educated to freedom in our present epoch of humanity. There is no contradiction, if you look into the matter correctly, between destiny and freedom. However, in order to be able to present the concept of destiny correctly to the world later on, it was first necessary that the concept of freedom be presented in the book The Philosophy of Freedom. You see, what must be done is not a blind scolding of agnosticism, for it is, in a certain respect, only the other side of phenomenalism. We read in the natural phenomena, but if we merely read, we do not find in them what we must seek on the higher paths of cognition. But for this very reason we really need natural phenomena only when we no longer instinctively bring out of our human nature what constitutes the impulses of our thinking. In older times, even in the times of Gnosis, We human beings brought forth active thinking from within ourselves, just as we brought forth hunger and thirst from within ourselves. At that time we were also not yet technical people in the modern sense. You only become a technical person when you embody pure thought externally in matter. Forgive me for bringing up something very personal again. I am convinced that if I had studied philosophy in the usual sense, Instead of being educated at a technical university and having found my way into this technical life of the present, I would not have written The Philosophy of Freedom. This is because such a philosophy 
is at the opposite pole to the experience of pure facts. And pure facts that are experienced in an external mechanistic view, which then also lead to phenomenalism, are on the other side absolutely what first calls forth the complete antithesis. Otherwise, one always brings out of oneself, in an instinctive approach, something that really dreams little demons into the clock. The truly spiritual is sought only through inner powers of cognition, which must first be acquired when we can no longer approach our physical environment through instinctive powers and bring into it what results from instinctive perception. Thus the age of technology with its machines is on the one side the fertile ground for a spiritual and anthroposophic worldview, and in this sense it is precisely from an utterly non-mystical approach of looking at the world, on the other side, that the clear cognition of the spirit must be brought forth through anthroposophy. It is not a new gnosis that must be found, which would be something based on mystically active instinctive thinking, but rather a search for real spirituality in the outer sensory and in the inner human being, along a path of cognition attained through exercises. We have to bring this course to a close, as we who were participants in this course are now obliged to part company. I thus wanted to present to you today what anthroposophy is in contrast to the prevailing agnosticism. Anthroposophy, as I have already mentioned, has definitely sprung from the scientific spirit of current times. This can be seen by anyone who compares my original, my first writings, with my later ones. Back then, it had taken a form in which at first simple human souls found themselves who tried to satisfy certain religious needs within anthroposophy. We may already say that quite a lot of such simple human souls, how many we do not know, have already found a most essential and absolutely necessary human inner spirituality in anthroposophy. With scientists themselves, it has always happened in a peculiar way. I can still see some of them sitting in front of me. I like to speak concretely. I can see, for example, a botanist sitting in front of me. He was a theosophist in that sense, which is perhaps also known to you, in the sense of an oriental mysticism, as it prevails, for example, in theosophic societies. I had before me one of the most learned botanists, so it was natural for me to talk to this gentleman about botany. To me it was something natural, but he didn't want to hear about it. No, no, botany must remain what it is in the university cabinet, not only with him, but also with other botanists. It should remain in the manner in which one acquires practical knowledge through the botanist's containers and the microscope. This should not be interfered with. Immediately when I began a botanical topic, he talked about etheric body, astral body, and even higher bodies. It was the rule in this theosophic movement that at first you spoke of all possible bodies up to the highest, where they became more and more nebulous. They did not characterize things as I have done here, by pointing out that the etheric body is a time organism, by trying to present the matter concretely, by characterizing the astral body as that which comes in from the spirit and soul and forms the body inwardly. Is it not true that I have tried to point out the characteristics of sleep, even if still imperfectly? I have always tried to characterize concrete things, but such people, as I mean now, were not interested in them. They only had such words for them as physical body, etheric body, astral body, then further kama manas, and then it went into the highest regions, which became thinner and thinner, but always remained material. It was a strange theosophic materialism, which especially confronted me once when I was at a theosophic congress in Paris. Various lectures were given there. I asked a personality, who was actually very advanced, how she had liked the lectures. She said, quote, Yes, it left wonderful vibrations, wonderful vibrations. Close quote. I felt as if she had said, quote, It smells extraordinarily good in this room after these lectures. Close quote. 
It was all transferred into the material. Many knew nothing of real spirit, and the man of whom I just spoke always sought things that went in this direction. I always sought something else. For example, the secrets of root formation, stem formation, flower formation, the spiral tendency of plants, their seed formation, or the like. The response was, no, no, anthroposophy must not enter into it, away with it. They wanted, again and again, to speak only of the astral body and buddhi and atma and the rounds and the globes, and all that spins around in the world in this sense. In short, I mention these things only as concrete examples. It was actually quite futile to approach scientists in their own scientism. Then, however, apart from a few who from the beginning had worked more in the philosophical field, such as Dr. Unger, more and more younger forces were discovered. And we would never have been able to found the Waldorf School in Stuttgart if a number of personalities had not taken up the individual subjects of science in the anthroposophic sense, out of an anthroposophic spirit. For only through this could we also pass over into pedagogy and didactics. Through this it has become possible to extend more and more what was formerly only for individual simple souls, and to really return to science in a certain way. Today we can already look to other fields. And you have been given examples of these further fields in which we can already work today, thanks to a whole number of younger forces who are working with extraordinary devotion on the development of the anthroposophic spirit in the individual concrete sciences. We may say that some things could be wished for in another direction. Work in the therapeutic medical field is still in its infancy. We also have all kinds of experiments to report, for example, in the economic field. In the latter area, however, it is evident, as may be seen from the events of the last few weeks, that it is not yet possible to work fully in the actual business world. Hopefully the things we have begun will continue and one day it will be possible to work in this field in the same way as, for example, work is being done today in many fields of science itself, and as work can be done in a thoroughly advanced way in pedagogy and didactics through the Waldorf School. Following on from this, it is really from a deeply grateful heart that I have to express my heartfelt thanks to those who, as friends of the anthroposophic movement, have brought about these university courses here in Holland. It is certainly not easy to organize such an event, and above all, in order to do the work that is necessary in such a case, it is absolutely necessary to have a deeper understanding of the matter. That this has come about fills us with a deep feeling of gratitude, and I am convinced that I am also speaking for the hearts and souls of all those who were allowed to speak here during this week-long course. And I would like to express this gratitude, first of all, to you who are the organizers of this course. I would then like to combine this feeling of gratitude, in turn, with hope. The hope that all those who have now turned their attention, in a beautiful way, to what has been discussed here during these days, will have the feeling that some suggestions have been given for them, even with the little we have been able to accomplish here in such a short time. Initially, we can do no more than make individual suggestions. I hope you have the opportunity to develop these suggestions, to try to penetrate further into what has already been worked out, but is still little known to the world. When you consider what has been worked out by the anthroposophic movement, the anthroposophic work, then you will see that this anthroposophic movement is not as its enemies, its opponents, who usually, because they cannot be objective, become personal, would like to portray it, but rather to the contrary. The anthroposophic movement is at least sustained by a really earnest scientific spirit. And furthermore, I may perhaps indulge in the hope that the very lectures I have tried to formulate here on these evenings may contribute something toward showing how in our time unconscious longings live in a large part of civilized humanity. And when these are brought to consciousness, they represent nothing other than the longings for something like anthroposophy. However, such desires can also be seen to exist due to all kinds of negative situations. In our time, there is a personality who has probably also become known here in Holland 
Oswald Spengler, who wrote a book about the necessary downfall of the West. I have witnessed how the, his book, titled The Decline of the Occident, has made a deep, devastating impression, especially on the youth of Central Europe. In this book, however, we have to do with the work of a man who is fully at home in twelve to fifteen sciences, who truly does not speak out of lightly seasoned knowledge, but who, nevertheless, speaks only out of the negative situations that are active in our time. Agnosticism, for example, is one such negative situation, if it represents the other side of phenomenalism, and we only want to stop at this phenomenalism. Another positive side also belongs to it. Anthroposophy tries to reach this positive side through spiritual paths of cognition. In this sense, I would hope that anthroposophy in its earnestness has spoken at least a little to your souls. We often have the feeling, when representing anthroposophy, that it has been here for decades, but we are always at the beginning. And actually, after decades, we now speak again of the very first beginning, even though it has already been conveyed to thousands and thousands of people in the course of these decades. We feel this not because of anthroposophy, which can wait. We feel this because of the longings of the times as something tremendously oppressive. Hence the deep satisfaction we have when people come together who want to know what anthroposophy is all about and who, by virtue of their serious grasp of life through study, are in a certain sense capable of judgment. For anthroposophy has nothing to fear from the ability to judge. I can assure you of this from out of the spirit of anthroposophy. Critics capable of judgment will always be most welcome to anthroposophy. So far, they have mostly become confessors of it after they have become acquainted with it. The more objectively we get involved with anthroposophy, also in a critical way, the better it is for anthroposophy. Thus, anthroposophy is not something that works on blind faith in authority or counts on an uncritical position. Those listeners, readers, and co-workers are most dear to it, who bring to it their fully discerning soul. Not, however, what is often brought up out of the agnosticism of the present, but what comes out of the truly unbiased inner human being. If we can also have the feeling that even though the Course was only a beginning, such beginnings must ultimately lead to something that is connected with the deepest longings and necessities of human development, then we can say that we leave such a course with a certain satisfaction. And so, I believe, from what has taken place here, those who have spoken will leave with a certain satisfaction, and above all with grateful hearts. And they would like to give themselves up to the hope that some stimulating things may also have taken place for the honored listeners. In this sense, please allow me to conclude this course by saying in the warmest way, out of this anthroposophic spirit, that if we have perhaps been united through some thoughts, then let us seek ways to continue to be together in spiritual work, to work together. In this sense, I bid you farewell for now. That is the end of Lecture 6, the end of the cycle of lectures, Becoming Fully Human, The Significance of Anthroposophy in the Contemporary Spiritual Life, translated by Jeff Martin. I am adding on to this the questions and answers given, I believe, after the um, lecture, they were given at The Hague on April 12, 1922. Question about multidimensional space. Rudolf Steiner If I have the usual coordinate axis system, then I have characterized three-dimensional space. We only want to discuss this schematically. Thus, based on certain algebraic presuppositions, you can abstractly continue the same process that leads from the plane into three-dimensional space and you get into the fourth dimension, into the fifth, and so on into n-dimensional space. And then it is even possible, let's say, to construct solid forms. Hinton did that, to construct a tesseract, for example. Yet this is not a real body, but only the projection of the real tesseract into three-dimensional space. Of course, there is nothing to be said against such constructions in a purely theoretical and abstract way. 
Theoretically, you can also go over, shall we say, from three-dimensional space to the fourth dimension as time, if you proceed within the calculation of formulas, in such a way that you take into account the jump that is made. For it is a different jump to pass theoretically from the first to the second dimension, or into the third spatial dimension, than to pass into time. But if you abstractly refine that, then you can move into time. This is how you get an abstract four-dimensional space. If you stay abstract, you can do it as long as you stick to what is purely intellectual, as long as you are not forced to follow things with clarity. But then you have the problem that while the purely abstract train of thought leads to a, quote, regressus ad infinitum, close quote, this clearly becomes a problem of elasticity. We could also initially think of a pendulum that keeps swinging. But in this dynamic, we will get a vibrational state. We really do. When you arrive at imaginative cognition, you can simply no longer carry out the process ad infinitum, where you assume a fourth dimension and so on. Then I am compelled, when I denote the first dimension plus A, the second plus B, and the third plus C, if I take real space, I cannot write the fourth plus D. But by the nature of the thing, I am compelled to write minus C. So that the fourth dimension simply cancels out the third little by little, and there are only two left. Instead of four, I get two dimensions at the end of the process. And so when I accept the fifth, I am compelled to put minus B, and with the sixth, minus A. That said, I'm getting back to a point. The elasticity bounces back to the starting point. And that is not something, for example, which only exists in my imagination. It is not a subjective experience. It is realized in the way I presented it the day before yesterday. You really have to do it. As long as you have, shall we say, the earth here and keep an eye on the roots of the plant, then you are dealing with a special development of the force of gravity. There you stand, within the usual spatial dimensionality. But if you want to explain the shape of the flower, you can't get by with that. Take space itself, which is only the inverse form of the point. And then, instead of going out centrifugally, you are going in centripetally. You come to wave surfaces. Instead of the thing spraying out, it pushes in from the outside. And then you get those movements that are sliding or shearing movements, pressure movements, in which you would go wrong if you were to take coordinate axes from a coordinate center. You must take the infinite sphere as the coordinate center point, and then pure coordinates going toward the center. Thus you get the qualitatively opposite coordinate axis system as soon as you come into the etheric. That this is not taken into account is the fault of the ordinary ether theory. Herein lies the difficulty in defining the ether. Sometimes it is seen as liquid, sometimes as gas. There is the error that they start from the coordinate system that is seen from the central axis point. But as soon as you come into the other, you have to take the sphere and construct the entire system in reverse instead of from inside to outside. Things become interesting when they are followed mathematically and go over into the physical, and some things could be contributed to the solution of borderline problems if we were to develop these theories, which are starting to become very real here. But there is still terribly little understanding for this. For example, I gave a lecture at a university mathematics society where I tried to introduce these things. I have stated that if you have the asymptotes of a hyperbola here, you have to imagine what you have here on the right spraying apart and here on the left spraying together so that a complete reversal takes place. These things gradually lead to a more concrete treatment of space. But there is little understanding for this today. There is often a certain aversion to synthetic geometry, even among pure analysts. In this newer synthetic geometry, 
is the way to get out of the problem of the purely formal mathematical in order to grasp the empirical. As long as you reckon with mere analytical geometry, you cannot approach the realm of reality. Only the endpoints of the coordinates have been formed, the geometric location of the coordinates and so on. If you stick to the linear and circular when constructing, then you stay within lines. But you have to use the help of a certain clarity. That is what makes synthetic geometry so beneficial in getting out of the formal and showing how one has to think the mathematical in outer nature. Question. What does Dr. Steiner mean when he says that the physical body is a spatial body and the formative body a temporal body? The physical body also lives in time, growing and decaying. Rudolf Steiner. Yes, but that is only thought imprecisely, if I may say so. In order to trace this back to precise thinking, you would first have to undertake an analysis of the concept of time. Just consider the way reality usually stands before us. Space and time are completely interwoven. You can only think such things if you distinguish space from time. In ordinary objective cognition, you do not have time at all. After all, you measure time using only the dimensions of space, and changes in the dimensions of space are the means of recognizing what then counts as time. Only try to think of a different time measurement. Otherwise, you always measure time according to space. This is not the case the moment you pass to a real experience of time. Most people do this unconsciously. Actually, thinking has to be raised to a higher consciousness through imaginative cognition. But you have a really temporal experience. If, for example, on April 12, 1922, at 4.04 p.m. and so many seconds, you look at your own soul life. If you take this soul life of yours right now, at this very moment, it is a temporal cross-section. You cannot say that there is any space cross-section within this temporal cross-section. Within this temporal cross-section, however, lies your entire earthly past. And if you want to draw it schematically, if this is the flow of your experience from A to B, then you have to draw the cross-section A to B. You can't help A, there's a large A here, but locate your entire experience into this cross-section, and yet there is a perspective in it. You can say that events further back in time are depicted with less intensity than closer ones. But all of this works in the one cross-section. Thus, if you really analyze this time, you can find other relationships that are all interconnected. We can only elevate time to a real mental image if we do not make the analysis that we are used to in physics by means of spatial cognition, but only by reflecting on our own soul life. In your soul life, however, if you have only abstract thoughts, You are then in your temporal life body. That is the important thing, that one really be able to grasp this temporal life body as an organism. You see, if you feel any indispositions, let us say due to this or that digestive disorder in the stomach, you can, under certain circumstances, perceive that completely different areas of your spatial organism are also affected. The spatial organism is such that the individual areas are spatially dependent on one another. In the case of the time organism, it is such that although we have a later and an earlier, later and earlier are connected in an organic way. It can be characterized like this. Let's say we have a very old person. We find that when this person speaks to younger people, to children, for example, her opinions bounce off the children. Her words mean nothing to the children. And yet we find with another elderly person that when he speaks to children, it is something completely different. Her words flow naturally into the children's souls. If you study this, you usually can study these things because you very seldom look at the whole person, because you can't keep your attention long enough, so to speak. You can observe, for example, how the strength of blessing that an older person can have stems from his or her early childhood. Observation is not extended that far today. Anthroposophy has to do that. There, when you go back, you will find that those who can bless in old age 
who in old age have this peculiar spiritual power in them, namely that their words flow into young people like a blessing, have learned to pray in youth. I would like to express it figuratively with the words, folded hands in youth become blessing hands in old age. There you have a connection between what acts as an influence on other people in later years and what pious feelings and the like existed in life in early childhood. There is an organic connection between the earlier and the later, and only when you know the whole person can you see how that person has an infinite number of such connections. Today we are stuck with a view of our whole life outside of this reality. We imagine that we are full of reality, but we are abstract creatures in our cultivation of life. We do not pay attention to reality. For example, we don't pay attention to the fact that when we teach children something, we have to avoid giving them sharply defined concepts as much as possible, especially during their elementary school age. Such concepts really work in a later age as though constricting the limbs and not letting them grow larger. What we give to the child must be an organism, must be mobile. You now gradually approach what I mean by an organism. Of course, this is only completely possible within imagination. But you arrive at an idea of an organism in any case if you are only clear about the fact that what takes place in a human being in time does not relate to the organism of space, but to the organism of time. And then it can manifest spatially in the body. Now, you see that there is a reality in time. Again, you can take it from mathematics. There was once a very nice discussion. I think it was Ostwald, not a follower of spiritual science, but a person who is not exactly a materialist, who drew attention to the fact that organic processes, which take place in time, cannot be reversed like mechanical processes. But now it is the case that you cannot even approach a time process with the usual calculations. With the usual calculations, you actually always remain outside time processes. They do not follow the processes as such. For example, if you put negative quantities in a formula for the lunar eclipse, you get things that are further back in space. But you don't move away with things in time. They only move in the space sphere. And so you only get a correct concept of what the physical body of the human being is if you can separate the spatial from the temporal. With the human being, this is of fundamental importance because you do not come to any understanding at all if you do not know that with humans everything temporal unfolds as an entity that dominates the spatial as something dynamic, whereas with a machine the temporal is a function that has only an isolated spatial effect. That is the difference. With the human being the temporal is real, while with the mechanism the temporal is only a function of space. This is what it ultimately comes down to. That is the end of the questions and answers and the complete end of Collected Works, Volume 82 by Rudolf Steiner.